So we're going to put this all together in this last podcast, and I'm going to give you a nice little chart that shows what you need to think about, and then we'll try some reactions. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to write the alkyl groups. So we have methyl, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now see, the goal of this chart is to be able to understand how to predict when a reaction will do an SN2 process, which means if it's chiral, it will have inversion of configuration, or an SN1 process, and if it's chiral, then it will have racemization or racemization, racemic mixture. Or if it will have either E2 or E1 making an alkene. And remember, when we make an alkene, um, the only thing you have to worry about here is Zaitsev's rule in looking for the most, um, the most stable alkene that forms. Now, if it's not chiral, it doesn't really matter here. Just like here, it doesn't matter whether it's E1 or E2 as long as you know it's going to make an alkene. So if we go through this process, for sure, methyl groups, backsides open, it's always going to do, if with a substitution reaction, it's always going to do SN2. It won't do SN1, and you don't have to worry about chirality because methyl and primary are not chiral. Now, of course, you can't make an alkene when you only have one carbon, so that's impossible. So the only choice with a methyl group is an SN2 process. SN1 is pretty much similar. You're going to have an SN2 process. You will not have an SN1 for the most part because you have very unstable carbocation. And the only way you really can have an alkene, um, form an alkene from a primary, is using a bulky base and slowing down the substitution reaction. So you would use a bulky base like sodium t butoxide. Now, at secondary is where you have the choices. You can have an SN2 or you can have an SN1. So you're going to have to control this probably with solvent. So you need a polar aprotic solvent. If you want the reaction to do uh, an inversion, or you're going to use a protic solvent like ethanol or acetic acid protic solvent here. And you will get um, alkenes formed um, if you have a strong base with a secondary. And remember, the strong bases that you're going to use, and I'll just, this is both the same in secondary and tertiary, is um, the ethoxides or OH minus. So with tertiary, you're not going to have SN2, but you will have SN1. So remember, the big decision that you have to make is whether it's chiral and whether it's going to go SN2 or SN1. Okay, so I have six different problems, six different alkyl halides, a different set of reaction conditions, and we're going to work through and look at our chart and make sure we understand what's going on with each one of these. Well, we have a primary alkyl bromide. We have a decent nucleophile. When you look at the chart, when you think about it, it's going to be an SN2 process, and you're going to have a substitution reaction. So CH2, CH2, um, S, CH3. There you go. Stinks to high heaven because you're using the sulfur compound, but we're just working on paper right here, so it doesn't really matter. Now, if we look here, we have a secondary alkyl bromide, and we have a strong base. So when you look at that, you're going to say this is going to do an elimination. So the elimination will happen where the O- minus will, uh, or the RO minus will take the proton next door. Here's the bromine. It will take the proton right here, and you will end up, because of Zaitsev's rule, with the double bond there in the more stable position rather than over here. Now, if we look here, we have a chiral secondary um, alkyl halide, and here is a nucleophile. It is not a strong base. 
it's cyanide, which I really wouldn't want to work with, but, um, or somebody can work with it. I'm not going to work with it. But we have acetone, which is sort of telling you that this is going to be an SN2 process because you need a polar aprotic solvent. So now when you run this reaction, just draw it so it inverts. So if we go like this, you'll go here and do the backwards and CN and make sure you have the C attached to the C because it's not the N that does the substitution. It's the C that bears the electrons that add to that bromine. And so now if we look here, what should look go through your head is that's a the bulky base. So that's going to form an alkene because we have a primary here and it won't do a substitution reaction. If I had just OH minus here, it would substitute. So if I draw this out, what you're going to get is you're going to get the alkene in the number one position. Now in my class, when we run this reaction, I usually call this a solvolysis reaction because we're using the solvent as the nucleophile. That's my key to my students that um, I want them to do an SN1 process. So this is a secondary alkyl halide. It needs a trace of acid. And when this reaction runs, the CH3O stays together and the H goes off with the chloride. So this is what substitutes because the O is, is what is the nucleophile. And you're not going to break off the methyl group from the O. You're going to break off the H. So the net result will be making of an ether. And I'll draw it out as CH3. And you don't have, I usually have them draw it flat. My students draw it flat and say racemic. And that tells me they know that it is both um, R and S. Now, this is my favorite sort of trick question. You have a secondary bromine and a strong base. And what's going to happen is you've, You've been practicing reactions, and you always want to put it in the more substituted position. But you can't put a double bond here because that would be five bonds to carbon. And so you have to put it here, and um, it's just a trick question. And don't fall for it, ever. Just realize it's a trick question. Well, it's not trick. It's just standard operating procedure for most professors. We'll put this on there. And remember, the double bond goes here because five bonds to carbon just doesn't happen. And there's no H next door. So if we go through and add the mechanisms to each of these, this is an SN2. This was an E2, probably not an E1. This is an SN2. This right here is an E2 for sure, because it would never go through an E1 because you wouldn't make a primary carbocation. And this solvolysis, lysis, that's spelled wrong, um, this would be SN1. And this last one is an E2 mechanism. Obviously, E2 and E1 make the same things. I usually think of with all of these, it will go E2. So that's elimination and substitution reactions. Um, work through and make sure you understand what this chart is and don't memorize it. And you should be able to do all sorts of reactions um, that compete.